Um, right, it's my great uh, pleasure to welcome you all to our fourth uh, presentation contest. Uh, and we're going to begin today with an uh, uh, introduction and welcome from uh, the uh, head of the presentation uh, committee, uh, Professor Sumi. So, Professor Sumi, if you'd like to welcome Professor Sumi. Uh, good afternoon. I remember uh, that today, you know, this uh, English presentation contest started originally four years ago. And uh, it's a quick, you know, it's past all quick and everything passed so fast. And now uh, we are here to have a fourth presentation contest at Meiji University. <coughs> okay, uh, today's presentation the contest theme of the contest is a citizen of the world. And here again, um, the key word is the globalization and changes. We know that we benefited to a great extent by the positive aspect of the globalization and uh, we have all the wealth and opportunities and the chances of the globalization which brought us. But at the same time, we are facing all the new coming emerging challenges of the globalization. I remember this year started off a bad, painful news about terrorist activities in Paris, France. In January, this year opened up with this. And uh, today, again, you know, I also received the news about uh, there is uh, some terrorist activities in Paris again in France, and there was more than 100 people uh, it's terrible. And so as we know, you know, this globalization is facing a lot of challenges. Environmental changes, refugees, wars, and in the midst of all the changes, uh, we are, maybe everyone in this world, is seeking to the new meanings toward what we should be doing in facing all these challenges. A citizen of the world. Well, I think the key word is again is a global citizenship. Something that we could possibly call, is there anything, something like a global citizenship? So that we can live and construct a better world. And in reflecting, and today's conference theme. Uh, we have all these uh, presentation topics ranging from the issues of refugees to uh, with Edward Snowden. And now uh, we know what's coming out more, and uh, we still at this moment don't know. You know, that's uh, very much in detail contents of the student presentation. Okay. So, today's um, presentation, before that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, today's judges for uh, today's presentation. And starting from <coughs> Michelle Yamamoto, and she is also, um, this is the third time she is here <coughs> for the presentation. She is a very popular face in the NHK world, and she is almost completely just fluent in French, English, Japanese, Spanish too. Uh, Italian? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. And thank you very much for joining us again. <laughs> and secondly, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, Vance Johnson. And he is sort of a founding father of English curriculum here to be the Thank you very much again for joining us again. <laughs> and the next one is Professor E. And uh, succeeding uh, Johnson, Professor Johnson's English curriculum, he uh, is the head and very important person uh, of English curriculum here in, uh, in our business department. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and okay, again, uh, Professor, uh, well, it's nothing for you, <laughs> James Howard, <coughs> and from the Graduate School of Management, and he uh, is originally from. Uh, MIT, graduating from MIT and Harvard, and now teaches 
and the variety of management theory related to the policy. And thank you very much for joining us again. Okay, next one is uh, Professor Hugh um, Graham Ma. The judge just joining us, you know, just uh, I'm so glad that he made it. And he's from our major universities, um, Organization for International Collaboration. Yes. Thank you very much for <laughs> And again, uh, Professor Sano, and he's originally from uh, Hak Hodo, uh, very well known uh, advertising agency. And now uh, teaches content business and web business related course. A very extremely popular uh, professor and student here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, finally, about uh, myself, uh, I. Uh, <coughs> Uh, also, he's not a judge. <laughs> so, well, again, uh, yes, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Rocky, and uh, he's an uh, associate professor here at our uh, management school. He will be giving us a very exciting, important, and stimulating comment, I hope. <laughs> and finally, uh, it's me, and my name is Atsushi Sumi, and uh, I think I'm a Mexican. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe just a little bit of me. Um, uh, I am teaching mainly here at uh, the in international management uh, courses here at the business faculty. Okay, and uh, finally, our uh, Mike and uh, Patrick Kian, and he is uh, <coughs> British American, uh, some German, originally from UK, mm -hmm. and uh, he is very actively you know, inst <coughs> institutionalizing our English curriculum here. Very important person. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, hello everybody. We need more energy here. Hi everyone. Hi. Great. Now I'm hearing voices and I'm here, here seeing smiling faces. Good. Hello everyone. I am Michelle Yamamoto. Thank you so much for your kind presentation. I am a news anchor for NHK World TV and Radio and I appear on uh, 150 countries worldwide. And you can also watch me on uh, smartphones and internet if you wish. And we do live broadcasts on Japan and international uh, affairs and cultures. So if you're interested, please do watch our program. Yes, so I have a little less than five minutes and I will do my best to keep everything on time because I was told beforehand that we have to be really punctual. I think you had that as well. And if I'm a bit late, I know that Professor Kim is going to... <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. I got everything in my hands. Okay. I'm ready. So, and it's my third time here to join you for your presentation contest. And I'm always, always looking forward to it because I'm very excited in learning about the things that you have to offer. I take so much notes every time because I learn so much from you every time. And I'm also very impressed with the progress that you make every year. So that's what I look forward to every, each and every year. So this year, I'm hoping to get lots from you again. So uh, and I'm hoping to talk to you again as well afterwards. So let's start with my presentation, with my few times that I have left. So, today I would like to talk about time, as timing and the bell. And have you ever imagined yourself traveling in time? Have you? Can I see some hands up who's imagined, who likes Doraemon and his time, time machines? Yes, I see some hands. Who likes Back to the Future? Well, I used to love watching, uh, reading Doraemon and watching Doraemon, and Back to the Future was one of my best movies when I was a teenager. And I was always hoping that one day Doraemon will pop up and I will be traveling in time. But as I grew older, I found out that that might not happen, maybe not in my time. But as I told you, I'm a news anchor, but I'm also a journalist. I go do interviews to many people, and I found that there are people who can travel in time. 
and I'd like to share one of that person with you. Uh, do you know uh, what this is? I'll show it to you first and see if you know. What's this? You know. One people. Any other? Well, actually, this is called an orin, or otherwise kesu. In English, it's called a singing bowl. It's used in, in the Western world, it's used for meditation. In Japan, it's used for religious uh, rituals, for Buddhist sects. For most of all, Buddhist sects uses it. And I met a craftsman who makes this. And he's in Toyama Prefecture. And he's a fourth generation of craftsman family. And I've been interviewing him, and he told me that uh, what he does it does not consist of the time when he lives, of his own time. He, has, he, he lives in a completely different time, which means that what he does is that he, also, uh, he does make his own personal handmade orins. In fact, there's only like 10 people in Japan who can hand make Handmade, uh, who makes these by hand with fire and hammer. There's only 10. And there's even fewer people who can fine tune them, the sound. I'll let you know that little, uh, in a little while. But there's only that many people who can make it. And this Shimatani san he's called, he told me that he has to repair these orins that come in from temples. And those, these stuff, it lasts forever. When you make them once, people don't buy it again for a very, very long time. And how long? Like a century. For 100 years, people will not buy a new one. Or people will not repair them. So what he has to work with are the things that come from 100 years ago. So he is always working with the craftsmen from 100 years ago. He sees their work. He feels their work. He listens to their sound. And he is always awed by their techniques. So he is saying that what he makes now is for the people in the future, the craftsmen in the future. What he makes will be repaired and used in the people who will be living in 100 years, in 200 years. So what he has to do is to not look at the things just in front of them, but look at the things far, far beyond to be able to work with the people there, far ahead. <coughs> so by doing that, he works in a really long span of time. So he tells me that he can, even if he is dead, he can still leave something behind him, of him, in the time that we will not exist anymore. So I was very impressed with what he was saying. And also, I saw, uh, I interviewed a director yesterday of Shinkai 6500. Do you know that? It's a vessel. It's a submersible vessel. It's like a submarine that goes underwater 6500 meters. And the director was an engineer. He was telling me, Michelle, you know, we don't make things to last like 10 or 10 years or so. We make things that last for more than 50 years. So when we design, when we create, we have to think of the people who are going to be using it in 50 years. So that, it shouldn't be something that feels old when you use it in 50 years. It doesn't, it's not something that seems antique. It has to be, you have to imagine about the people. What will they need? How will they use it? So when you think of the needs of the people ahead, you will always know what to create. And they will never be too old and they will always stay in time, is what he was saying. And that's just last night that I heard it in Yokosuka. And he was a very, very wise man and a very energetic engineer. So, come back to think of it. I think that we can travel in time. That is that we can leave something in time if we really work hard, if we really have our will set, and if we really see what we want to do and know and think about the people ahead. We can travel in time with something like this, with what we create. So, before I end, I would like for you to listen to the sound that's going to last for 
a few centuries. Close your eyes and listen. Ready? Thank you very much for your time, and I wish you lots of luck with today's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll be more energetic to listen to our presentation after a short break. Well, we are happy to give our presentation here. First of all, we'd like to introduce ourselves. I'm Yang Dongping. This is Wang Hao. Uh, Marina Alan. Yoshitaka Yasuda. Manami Yamazaki. Uh, the main idea of uh, today's presentation is that young people should express their views in a more active way. Uh, uh, this is it, the outline of our today's presentation. There are together six parts. As we all know, young people are the futures of our society. However, according to a research conducted by the Japanese government, it seems that Japan's young people has a much lower political participation rate compared to other developed countries. Uh, one explanation is that because of Japan's high regard for seniority and its relatively reserved culture, young people in Japan tend to think that expressing their views on political and social issues is useless. However, Gandhi once put it, you must be the change you wish to see in the world, so young people themselves must take effort to be the change instead of just waiting for the change. They are young now, but one day they will be the one who has this ability to influence the whole world. So of course young people's opinions are important, and of course they should express them. Well, in the following part, we'll introduce the story of Malala Yousafzai to see how these young girls' opinions can make the differences in the world. Maybe you know who is her. Yes, she is Malala Yousafzai. Malala Yousafzai is a 17 years old girl from Pakistan. She is an activist for female education. She once said, one child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. In 2009, Malala began writing blog about fears that her school will be attacked and the increasing military activity in her hometown. In 2011, Malala won the Pakistan's first national young peace prize, but at the same time, she received the death threats from the Taliban. However, she continued to speak out her voice for education. In 2012, she received the attack and in a critical condition. In the weeks after the attack, over two million people signed the right to education petition. In 2014, Malala accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. She started the Malala Fund to bring awareness to the social and economic impact of girls' education and to empower, empower girls to rise their ways. Malala is a normal teenager. However, her breathing, speak out on belief of girls' education also makes Malala extraordinary. In the next, we'll talk about the situation in Japan. First, we cannot deny that political participation rate of Japan, Japan's young people has a slight increment in recent years. Recently, we can often see a student union called SEEDS or media. This student union has taken an active part in the demonstration of arms security law. They show their strong opinions and <coughs> greatly change the image uh, in which young Japanese people care about politics. Other student union use crowdfunding to collect money for their activities and helping many other young people 
to express their ideas of Japan's politics. However, there is still a long way to go for Japan. Look at this chart. Japan has a distinct difference between the young and the old. <coughs> Comparing to other de developed countries, this result shows the fact that young people in Japan still pay no enough attention to politics than the old. When talking about this, uh, when talking about solution to this problem in Japan, we think Sweden is a good example in encouraging young people speaking up. The voting rate of less than 24 years old exceeds 70 percent, and <coughs> political participation rate of young people is also very high. In Sweden, there is youth division where the young can express their view. And some influential ideas will be put into practice. In Sweden schools, students can explain democracy. It means Sweden has successfully the idea of democracy into the education system. Also, Sweden parties has youth department to collect opinion from young people. From all these things, we find that Sweden's government has this strong wing to invite the young taking part in social decision making and guarantee their right to speak. We think Japan's government should learn from Sweden's case and maintain a positive environment for young people's opinion to be reflected. Expect for government aspect. Young people themselves should care about social problems in daily life. So in the third part, we would like to talk about our express experience. When I was in uh, when I was in senior school one day, I visited the uh, local government and saw a man in the wheelchair stopping in front of the stairs at the entrance uh, because there was no slope for the disabled. Um, thanks, thanks, to, thanks to the help of some people, including me and my parents, finally the man in the wheelchair uh, entered the government office. But I had a strong feeling that the government office should provide specific entrance for the disabled. So I wrote down my uh, I wrote down my suggestion in on the paper and sent it to the local government. After a few months, uh, when when I visited the local government again, new entrance road for the future has been already established. I think I think the most of the young people tend to think the government officers don't have the time to listen to a teenager. So, although they have some useful opinion in mind, they are not willing to express them. But looking back my case, my opinion, has, my, my opinion could be cared by the government. So, first, we should speak out bravely, and then we can, we can have the chance to influence our society. In conclusion, according to increase the political participation rate in Japan, uh, we should create a mutual trust between the government and the young people. Uh, first, the government should have uh, uh, provide more assets for young people to express their opinions, and they should express what the young people think. And of course, uh, more important, young people themselves they should know that their personal lives is integrated with the social development. So it's their responsibility to express what they think in mind in a more active way. That's all. Thank you for your listening. Thank you.
very much for expressing your opinions there. Uh, question I think you've got back. Thank you for your nice presentation. In your presentation, you said the Japanese young people pay less of attention to the politics. My question is, why the Japanese young people don't care about the politics? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you for your questions. Um, I think uh, since the some of the young people in Japan, they may think that the politics, politics is too far away from their daily life, and compared to the latest faction of some delicious food, uh, they think that the social and the political affairs is uh, not that close to their daily life. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, the young people, they should uh, know that, uh, as I said in the conclusion, that their personal lives are also uh, connected to our social development, uh, so uh, they should express their views uh, in the important issues happened in this society or uh, uh, or around the world. And of course, there are one ma uh, another major reason that uh, we uh, explained in the beginning that uh, most young people think that expressing their opinions is uh, useless. Um, I think uh, this. Uh, this problem can be uh, should be uh, uh, solved by the both the government, uh, young people, and the whole society because uh, uh, the government should provide more access for young to speak. Uh, so the young will have this willing to speak out what they think. And of course, in uh, in the Japan society, that's um, I know that in Japan's culture, that's. Um, it said that young people should expect, uh, respect the views of the old, but also I think the old should also listen to the young people's ideas because experience is important, but um, some uh, young people can always come up with some creative things, I think. Um, and so the, our surrounding society should also uh, support our young people uh, to uh, encourage them to speak out what they think. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, you mentioned about Sweden. Sweden has a better education system and other blah blah blah. blah. Could you explain more about why Sweden um, young people are more in the system? Is there any relationship with the election system? No. Uh, in fact, we have uh, talked about the Sweden's success in encouraging young people to speak out. There are uh, three major points. Uh, the first one is that they have a system uh, in, in its government to uh, promote the youth participation. And the second point is that uh, they, uh, they uh, um, put the idea of democracy in the, their education system. They say, uh, which means that uh, the young people, uh, no matter they are in middle school or high school, they can experience democracy in their early age. So they have this uh, idea that I'm responsible for my society. Uh, and the third point is that uh, there are many parties in the Sweden, um, but each of the party, they have these youth divisions to collect the youth opinions uh, from the Sweden and uh, what they think about their party's policies or something like that. So because Sweden has this uh, strong official mechanism for the young to speak, so the young in Japan has a much uh, high passion for uh, to speak out what they think. Uh, this is uh, what we meant. Thank you for your question. Uh, right, so our next... Uh... Good afternoon, everyone. And today we will talk about uh, Snowden. Um, my name is Ting, and I will talk about uh, who is still Snowden, and what did he do, and what is prison. And the second part, Tatsuki will tell us 
what is citizen of the world, and he will explain why Snowden is a good citizen of the world. And the last part, Hisong will tell the people's will tell us people's reactions of the Snowden issue, and he will make a conclusion. And mention the word of citizen of the world. Our team first out is Snowden, and then who is Snowden? Snowden is a former U.S. CIA staff and the National Security Agency outside technician. And what did he do? He just uh, disclosed a secret document to the world. What kind of documents? It uh, talk about the U.S. NSA plan to monitor projects on the prison. Um, and then what is pr what is prison? Prison is a clandestine. <laughs> sorry. Clandestine means uh, electric surveillance state program known to have been operated by the US NSA since 2007. And go back to Snowden. Snowden's story began in 2013 and he arrived in Hong Kong at May 12th. And next week he leave Hong Kong to Moscow and uh, August 1st Russian grants Snowden a refugee status for one year, and last week Snowden opened a three years resistance permit in Russia. And then? And before explaining <coughs> why Snowden is a good citizen of the world, I'll give an idea about what the world <coughs> citizen is. World citizen can be defined as a person who places their identity with a global community about their identity as a citizen of the particular nations or places. Um, in other words, it can, uh, in other words, world citizens have identity that beyond political or geography borders. Uh, there is this picture shows there's no border, borderline between the countries. Like this, people are living in, in the same world and same time. Then, why Snowden is a good citizen of the world? Of course, he has an identity that's beyond borders, but also he has the power to make the people become world citizens. There is three reasons. First, Snowden published information for all mankind, not only for USA. He did exposure as a world citizen, not as an American. And second, he gave opportunity for all mankind to think about the danger of our information society. In our information ages, we are accustomed to managing managing personal data on the internet. But from his exposure, it appears that the government led company to send users information without our approval. Like this, uh, we have too much trust on the internet. Snowden made us aware of the, such um, important issues. If it were not for his exposure, we couldn't even be aware of such a danger. Third, he changed, the, he changed our behavior and thoughts about the freedom in the information society of all mankind. Snowden's action as good, good citizen, good world citizen, made people to begin to think and act by themselves, and regardless of where they live. From these three points, we can say that Snowden encouraged the establishment of our identity that beyond borders as a world citizen. That's why Snowden is a good citizen of the world.
Okay, in my part, I want to speak about the world's reactions to the Snowden disclosure and what the most of Americans think about this event. So I choose three countries for examples about the world, world reactions. And the first country is Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, the Chung ying Nung, who is the Hong Kong chief executive, say that the government will handle the case of whistleblower Edward Snowden in accordance <coughs> with the laws and established procedures of Hong Kong when the relevant mechanism is activated. He said that because the Edward Snowden uh, flew the country to Hong Kong first, so Hong Kong and the United States made a treaty that allows for extra extraditions, and so, uh, but there are several scenarios about under which Snowden uh, might avoid being returned to the United States. And the second country is Russia. Putin, who is Russia president, said that Russia may grant political asylum to a former CIA whistleblower who has revealed Washington's highly classified global surveillance programs. Uh, the word asylum is means which is the protection uh, that the government gives the people who, live, who have left their own country. So also in 2013, there was another event that the Snowden called him to ask a question of Putin through a live broadcast. So Putin answered to Snowden that um, the Russia was involved in mass and in, in discriminate, but they use modern means to fight hackers and terrorism in this in these days. And the third country is the USA. The person is James Comey, who is FBI director, said the US has launched a criminal investigation and is taking all necessary steps to to prosecute whistleblower Edward Snowden for exposing secret U.S. surveillance programs. And also, he said he loved to apprehend the Edward Snowden, uh, so the Snowden can use the benefits of the world criminal justice system in the world. And next, uh, I want to show a chart about how many Americans think about this disclosure. And first, the 80. 18 to 29 year olds said that almost 60% of people said it has served public interest more than the harmful effect. And in contrast, it is almost exact mirrors to, to the 65 and overage groups. And also, 30 to 49 year olds group said the leaks has served public interest more, almost more 10% than the harmful effect. And however, uh, 50 to 60 year olds and 65 plus group is overwhelmingly said the disclosure has harmed the public interests. Okay, finally, uh, what can we learn about the Snowden disclosure? I think the most important lesson is that the one point is that we think of our freedom as something that is either, either granted or taken away from us by government. I think this is partially but not completely true. And the second point is that there are ways in our lives that we can choose to embrace or reject freedom. Uh, and these days, all of us, but especially those who work for government and government contractors, uh, they often faced with the problem, often faced with the choice of accepting a more comfortable lie or taking the risk to live the more difficult truth. Okay, thank you for listening. If anyone has uh, any questions of our presentation, please ask us. Thank you. Another one that spots on time, and uh, I'd like to welcome questions. Um, you raised three countries where there was reactions on the Snowden effect. What was Japan's reaction, and how do you think Japan should act going forward? Okay, uh, I think uh, Japan is one of country of Asia, like Hong Kong, and so um, okay, maybe I think Japan should com comprehend the Snowden because he was not just not only Americans but also you know, worldwide because he was he wanted to inform the informed the citizens of more widely because he was in the misconduct and working.
So, um, are you Chinese people? Chinese. You Chinese people. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you. I'm, I'm, I'm Korean. I, the, the question is uh, about Japanese, okay. but uh, Japan. But I, I think the Chinese um, web security policy is completely different from both United States and Japan. And how about the Chinese perspective from both from Chinese government and from Chinese citizens? <laughs> Yeah, Chinese have the uh, GFW, a great, great wall, fair, a great fair wall, yeah, it's great fair wall. And we can get, uh, we can use the Facebook or YouTube or Twitter in my hometown. But I, I don't think it's a good thing for us. But government thinks um, Chinese have a most population in the world. Maybe, uh, it's not, but it's have to many population in the Chinese to difficult to control us. And so maybe it's government things, but I, um, in my opinion, it's not good for. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Nice presentation. And uh, I just got one question. How will uh, Snowden affect our daily lives from your point of view? Okay, I can give an example. If you send a message to your girlfriend to get your appointment tonight, so open my item at, at the next second, open up will know that you send a message to your girlfriend. <laughs> Just you have no secret in um, gov uh, USA governments and they those all about it. Yeah, thank you for asking. Hello everyone. Today we live in a globalized world. As a proof of that, we four are from different countries. I'm Bomi from Korea. I'm Celia from the US. I'm Michelle from Japan. I'm Alonso from Mexico. In this globalized world, we need global citizens. And we conducted our own survey about a similar question, and the answers were like these. And these answers are similar to um, our, thought, our opinion about global citizen, which is a global citizen is culturally intelligent. Now that we know a global citizen is culturally intelligent, we have to define what cultural intelligence is. Cultural intelligence was developed by P. Christopher Early and Soon Ang in the early 2000s, and it's defined as a person's capability to adapt effectively to new cultural contexts. This can be divided into four parts, and each of these parts can be learned so that everybody can take these parts and make them personally applicable to ourselves, which we will each do when introducing each of the parts. <coughs> the first part I'm going to introduce is motivational cultural intelligence. Motivational cultural intelligence is having the desire and the persistence to adapt effectively to new or to other cultures. This often means that you have to be able to look at your own culture and question your beliefs and values along with other cultures. In order to improve this or to grow in your motivation, you should have goals, you should be open-minded, you should build ne networks within your own culture and then the culture that you're in. You should have desire clear communication and you should be curious about the things that you encounter. Along with that, I have my own personal story. When I was a child, I used to watch Pokemon a lot, and sometimes there would be some bad translations in the Pokemon, um, from the Pokemon Japanese version to the Pokemon American version. One of these translations is they used to call only kitty balls donuts, and they would eat them for lunch, and I would realize that you don't eat donuts for lunch, and so I would wonder what it really was. I ended up learning about and um, looking into Pokemon and then in turn looking into Japanese culture and Japanese society. This in turn brought me to where I am right now presenting to you guys today. <coughs> On a broader scale, if you don't develop a motivation for cultural intelligence, it can lead to misunderstandings and distrust on an individual scale. On an interpersonal scale, it can lead to misunderstandings and lack of depth in 
relationships, and even on a global scale, it can lead to conflict and war. Next is Yui Chiro, who's going to discuss the cognitive part of cultural intelligence. All right, I'm going to talk about cognitive part. So, pretty simply, what is cognitive? Cognitive is knowledge. It's like you face the difference, then you recognize the difference. At that moment, you accumulate those differences. Now, that is knowledge for you. And then, how to improve that? It's like you can observe, ask people when you're in different culture, or and learn from books on the internet. Let me give you an example. I've been done for a Japanese company and a Singaporean company in Singapore, I ago. There, I faced some like cultural differences. It's like in Japan, for example, um, it's gonna take time to make a decision in a business meeting. Japanese businessmen they take so much time to make a decision, and but it's really like common. Um, in Japan. Contrary to that, in Singapore, Singaporean business people, they make a decision very first all the time. I was really surprised that, that their high-speed decision-making, and then at the moment, my ex-Singaporean boss told me, you know in Singapore, it's really easy to see whether they are interested or not, because they say yes or no on the spot. Um, there, um, it became the knowledge for me to use, to help you understand how it works a little bit more, we have some data um, that we collected from our survey and a specific research. We've asked around like 40 people around the world um, that do you think is it important to prepare yourself before going to a new country? Then more than 60% of people answered positively. It's, um, it's showing that it is usual to gain knowledge um, before you're going to a new country. And next to that, next to this, that is a um, Article is a, that is a sorry that article is a result of our study about that um, whether expatriates should have um, knowledge of the country they are supposed to go to um, and then um, the result is like if they have those knowledge their adaptation into the country um, became better this this study is about expatriates data but the result can apply for anyone so. Um, having knowledge is important to be a global citizen. Next, Bomi is going to talk about metacognitive work. I'm going to explain to you about metacognitive. Metacognitive is one of the facets of the uh, cultural intelligence that one can fully understand about the meanings of cultural behaviors. This can be improved by open-minded mindset and struggling to figure out the meanings of behaviors. And also, it has really close meaning to understanding, so this mindset and struggling can also improve understanding, which is one of the most important factors to be a global citizen. Let me give you my own example. When I arrived in Japan, I really didn't know much about Japanese mode of life. What I only knew is I should try not to bother other people as much as possible. However, sometimes I made a mistake. For example, the first several times when I went to a Japanese restaurant, the, some waiters asked me to sit at the corner side of the place, and I didn't know why. Then, when I, with, when I met my cousin who stayed in Japan for a long time, I asked him why, and he, what he said is, in restaurants, customers have to sit, uh, take, table, take seats from the corner side of the place because not to bothering the late come customers. Now I fully understand these situations, and um, what I want to say from my example is I made a, I have trouble in application. And um, metacognitive can also be an important factor as a global citizen because um, understanding, um, without understanding, one cannot fully adapt to um, other cultures because um, only understanding can make it personally applicable. Next is Alonso with the behavior. Behavioral is the last stage of cultural intelligence, and it is basically act and behave according to the local culture. And because of this, it involves having flexible responses to sweep all kinds of situations. Now I will explain a couple of examples about how my behavior has changed since I came to Japan. In Mexico, I used to smoke all the time, almost one pack of cigarettes per day. But here in Japan, because I can only smoke in smoking areas, I'm smoking just one per week, which 
because not even in my dorm I'm allowed to smoke yeah, just on smoking area. The, another example is about being punctual. Mexico people is not punctual at all. We arrive from 30 minutes to one hour late. It must be difficult to believe for you, but it's true. So when I had my first appointment with Japanese friends, I I knew it, I have to be punctual because the culture is different. So I tried to arrive at six, but I arrived six and five, and it was very impressive that when I arrived, everybody was gone. I had to go to the restaurant by myself. <laughs> now, how we have seen, um, act and behave according to the culture is important to avoid problems and misunderstandings. But it's mainly important to demonstrate respect to the culture. Now, moving to the conclusion, through this presentation we have talked about the four parts making up cultural intelligence. Motiv motivational is persistence. Cognitive is knowledge. Metacognitive is understanding. Uh, behavioral is performance. Yeah, and all those four factors are converged together to create cultural intelligence. Because you can improve your cultural intelligence, having cultural intelligence makes you be a global citizen for this globalized world, like we are. Thank you for listening. I am. Thank you for those insights and support for your questions. Any further questions? Thank you. You mentioned the survey a couple of times in your presentation. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Um, the first time we mentioned it, it was uh, the intro, and we basically did a survey on uh, Facebook, and we asked our friends and our family from around the world um, to comment on it, and I think we got people from at least like 11 different countries. But um, they commented on it, we had about 43 responses, and we put that into our survey. And we just asked questions about global, um, a global citizen, and then cultural intelligence and their thoughts. Thank you for your interesting discussion. Metacognitive, cognitive, and uh, motivation behavior, I think um, it includes everything. And uh, maybe it's uh, theoretically good for improving cultural intelligence, I agree. But I'm not quite sure how can we improve all everything at once or gradually? Or anyway, I'd like to know about your opinion on so how actually can we improve cultural intelligence? Um, at each of our part, we mentioned how to improve it. Like, for example, I mentioned my one as an uh, open-minded mindset and struggling to uh, find the meaning beyond the, their behaviors like that. So, um, I think we mentioned it before. Um, yeah. Is this through education or experience or? It's both. It's through both. You have to look at yourself and see what you want to improve on. It's basically you, if, like I said before, if you have the motivation to do it, then you're going to do it. You're going to go through those um, those process or the, those steps of um, looking at the cognitive part, wondering why it's done, and behaving like you want to. It, it's a, it's a personal thing. Um, you can do it through education, and it can help. Like the expatriate study that you two mentioned, um, they gave expatriates um, uh, knowledge before going over the cross-cultural training, and uh, looking at that, they saw that they had adapted better, but you also have to be motivated personally, and you have to like look at it yourself. Handle it drastically over time. Oh, sorry, lost the question there at the back. <laughs> um, thank you for the presentation. Um, um, Celia, you mentioned the translation of, of Onigiri, and I thought that was very interesting. Um, I'm not an expert in um, 
translation studies, but I do know that a lot of debate has been going on about um, when you translate whether you stay um, loyal to the to the original linguistic and cultural context, or do you um, sort of um, make things easier for people in the target linguistic and, and um, cultural context. So I was just wondering, I assume that all of you speak both English and Japanese, so how would you translate onigiri? Uh, <laughs> I just, um, obviously most um, um, English speaking children would probably not understand rice balls either, they probably wouldn't know what they are. So um, I suppose, you know, they chose the word donut um, because it's food, it's round in shape. Um, but yeah, I was just, I, I'm not saying it's the perfect option, but how would you translate the word onigiri for children who um, just don't know what, what uh, they can are? I, can I ask you why you think the rice ball is not enough? Um, right, okay, uh, so thank you. <laughs> um, because they would probably, hmm, um, I, sorry, I, I don't really watch Pokemon. Do any of them actually have Japanese names there? Do, I mean, do, I think they probably were trying to make the characters sort of universal rather than Japanese characters. So, um, yeah. Well, I mean, when I was watching it, like, for me, it was more of like a time thing because they were eating lunch and they were eating donuts for lunch. You don't eat donuts for lunch, so if anything, if I were going to translate it in my language, it would probably be sandwiches. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. At the beginning, I think that uh, Ms. Yamamoto gave us a very provocative question, and that was, what do you leave in time? <clears throat> Which I'm still thinking about. But I also have a question that I was just asked, and that is, cut out the what? And it is, do you leave in time? And uh, I would like to speak very shortly <laughs> about what I think about the contest. First of all, I'd like to thank those who uh, did all the presentations. It obviously takes a tremendous amount of hard work and a lot of training, and uh, I'm sure that, excuse me, you're going to find that this has helped you uh, very much, something to look uh, forward to doing again or for happy memories once that you graduate. Just one or two things. Um, First of all, it's rather obvious, but it's important to remember that this is a speech contest. And a speech contest is not an essay. And the big difference is that in an essay, if you don't understand, you can look at it again. If you don't understand, you can look at it again. You can look at it again. With the speech contest, this is it. You only have one chance. This is your only opportunity to convince your audience. So what can you do to convince your audience, to persuade them to your viewpoint, and to make your best presentation? Um, first of all, think of your introduction, how you stand up here, how your first sentences react to the audience are very important. And one thing I think if there was any sort of weakness in most of the presenters is that I don't think you considered your audience quite enough. Um, most of you were looking and spending most of your time looking at your own visuals. But the important thing is, how are you connecting with your audience? This is who you need to connect with. And to do that, of course, eye contact is important. But also, you need to sweep the crowd. And one thing I always do that helps is sweep the crowd and find not just a pretty face, but somebody that looks interested. 
and you kind of come back to this person, and if they look puzzled, then it means they don't understand what you have just said. And so remember, it's do people understand what you are talking about? And if they don't understand, no matter how good your presentation is, the effect is not good because they don't understand. So th this is a very important thing. Um, another thing, too, is that I think most of us realize that having an outline at the beginning helps you very much. In other words, okay, speech goes from A to B to C to D. These are called transitions. And if you have the outline, and not just show it and bang, it disappears. Actually go over <laughs> quick the outline, say it out loud, so people will say, ah, yes. And then when you make a transition, when you go from a change in part A to part B, part B to part C, part C to part D, let people know. Let people know that you are actually making the transition. And one way that you can do that is to just briefly summarize what your point was, um, is another way that you can do that. Um, another thing that many of you did a very good job today on is that you need supporting evidence. In other words, you don't just say something and expect people to believe it. You have to give a people reason to believe that what you're saying is true. And so therefore, I think, doesn't become all that important because people don't know you. And if you say, Bill Gates thinks or something, well, then people might be a little bit more interesting. And at the end you can say, and I agree with you. See, that makes you important, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of a joke. Um, <laughs> I think my time is about up. So <laughs> we started with the introduction. Okay, let's go to the conclusion. And if you have the outline, one of the best things to make a good conclusion is just go over your outline. What was point A? What did you do? What was point B? What did you do? What was point C? And therefore our conclusion is. And then people will say, ah, yes. Because what you want to do is you want people to remember your presentation. And I think if you think of the presentations that we had today, which presentations do you remember? My guess is it's the ones that were the easiest for you to clearly understand what everybody was doing and what the conclusion was. So again, I thank everybody uh, that participated and uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I think my time is up. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, and to all the people who participated in this um, event, um, when I was working um, as a businessman, I was asked, what is the translation for Otsukarasama? And it was very, very difficult. And we came up with a conclusion. It's thank you for being tired. <laughs> so thank you for being tired, everybody. Um, I don't need. I don't want to take up too much time. So well, just one point that I'd like to mention. Um, I know. I understand. For many of you, it was a challenge to present in English. It's a different language. It's, you don't know the vocabulary as well. You can't memorize the script as well. Yes, it's challenging. One thing you can do is believe in what you say. If you strongly believe in what you are saying, you will have energy. Your voice will get naturally louder. You want people to understand that passion, energy, is very, very important. If you don't, if your language skills aren't that good, just show your passion. 
if you can show your energy and passion, that will help you communicate to all the people. I think Michelle was showing a great example. She showed a lot of passion in her, in her great speech. So please remember that. Please remember to just go for it. Okay? お疲れ様でした。